Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. The first story, I didn't let an impatient contractor through the gate and make him late for work. The second story, sergeant didn't want to listen to me so I poured out the chemicals as I was ordered. The third story, chef did not say when the order would be ready, so I left to do other things. On to the first story. The time I used a piece of paper to peeve off an ex-Navy SEAL in Afghanistan. This is the story about how I used a little piece of paper to peeve off a contractor. Players here are me, a specialist at the time, my team leader, a sergeant, a piece of paper signed by an Air Force captain, and a really impatient former SEAL, now civilian security contractor. The story. We had a gate that led in and out of a large NATO compound in Afghanistan that was closed at night and open during the day except for two times. Those two times were supposed to be so we could have a break and sit in the shack with the air conditioner for a while. We closed the gate once in the morning for an hour and a half and once in the afternoon for 45 minutes. I'm okay with telling you this because after we left they permanently sealed the gate and created a different point of entry into the compound so not violating OPSEC. Well, when this gate was closed, the only people allowed to go through were the commanding general of our compound, and anyone with more than one star, and units in tactical vehicles going out or coming back from a mission. So says the Air Force Security Force Captain, and he made sure to print out those orders and put them in our little shack. The exception to this was when the Base Defense Operations Center, or BDOC, would call us over the radio and tell us to let people through on a case-by-case -case scenario. The problem was that it didn't matter what your reason was. The BDOC would always say yes. This made everyone that worked that post very frustrated, because what was the point in closing the gate to give us a break, if we still don't get a break? If anything, it made our lives worse, because it took a lot of work to move the giant metal gate it opened and closed. Anyway, after a while, everyone just stopped calling the BDOC, and just asked the people working the gate to let them through. Most people that are not me would let's say F it and let them through. So much so that they started to expect it. One thing that you should know about me is that I don't like being wrong, and if you follow the rules, you are not wrong, usually. Well, one day I was working that post and it was time to close the gate. I let my TL know, so he can call it up, and I shut it down and start to chat with some of the Georgian contractors that worked with us. Well, we hear a horn honk and I go walk to the bars next to the gate so I can see what's up, and it's this one specific contractor. He's known for being arrogant, rude, and a pee. Very quick to remind you that he's more high speed than you are and how cool he is. Well, I keep things professional, but I hated this guy, and I was already frustrated about having to open the gate, not even three minutes, since I closed it, so I decided to be extra. Me equals me. Impatient contractor equals ex-seal. Me. Good morning, sir. Where are you headed? Ex-seal. Hey, man. Open the gate. I have to get to work. Me. I apologize, but I can't let you through. My orders are when the gate is closed, I'm only allowed to let through the general and tactical vehicles going on mission. Since you're neither, I can't let you through until the gate opens back up in an hour and 25 minutes. Ex-seal. B.S. They let me through all the time. Just let me effing through. Me. Again, I'm very sorry. I'm only following orders. I pull the copy of the orders out of my pocket. See? Here it is. Signed by CPT Redacted. Ex-seal. Oh, for F's sake, specialist, just let us through. Me. Sir, I do not have the rank to disobey a direct order from a captain. The only way you can come through is if you either wait or the BDOC radios in that I can let you through. You could try calling the BDOC and asking them to have me let you through. At this point, the contractor turns and walks away, cursing me, the Army, the Army National Guard, the infantry, my mom, Afghanistan, the dirt, and his up armored land cruiser. I walked over to the truck my TL was in, and he pokes his head out of the turret. I proceed to tell him about what I just pulled, and to let me know when the BDOC calls to have me open the gate for him. He looks at me all serious and asks, is he mad? Me. Oh, he's furious. TL. Good. Proceeds to high five me because we both hate that D. So I walk over to the shack and wait. After about 30 minutes of doing a crossword puzzle, my TL yells to me that the BDOC called and asked me to open the gate. With a thumbs up and a roger that, sergeant, I get up and open the gate. The vehicle goes through and I close the gate. He shoots me a death glare as he drives by, and I give him a smile and a wave, knowing that I just inconvenienced him and probably made him late for work. The best part is that I found out later from my squad leader that my first sergeant is the one who answered the phone in the BDOC. 
Well, Mr. High Speed gave the 1SG an attitude, and the 1SG gave him an earful. I don't know what all was said, but if you were ever in the army and in the infantry, you know how bad it can be when you F with the 1SG. The end result was that he would call to open the gate after he knew for sure that enough time had passed to make sure that the ex-seal was guaranteed to be late. The ex-seal guy made sure to be earlier of the gate closing after that. The second story is... Arrogance plus apathy equals chemical spill. As an x-ray tech student in the US Army in the mid-80s, we had to do several weeks of OJT, on-the-job training, after finishing our school training, and I was assigned to a hospital in El Paso, Texas. Normally, we were assigned to work in a different area each week. I especially enjoyed fluoroscopy and special procedures week. I don't remember what rotation I was assigned at the time, but was surprised when the student leader told me I was going to spend the day cleaning film processors. It didn't bother me, as I had seen it demonstrated in the school, but had never done it before. I was told to find SP4 Slacker for directions. I call him Slacker because that was his personality, not his name. While I was temporarily assigned to this hospital as a student, Slacker was permanent and considered part of the staff of X-Ray Techs. I found him taking a nap in an unused X-Ray room. After rousing him, he walked me through cleaning the first processor, before giving me the list of other processors, and then returning to his nap with instructions to wake him when I was done. It wasn't a difficult task. Each processor had two tanks of chemicals, one for developer and the other one for fixer. I had to drain these tanks, and then clean and rinse the tanks and rollers before putting the rollers back in place, and refilling the tanks with fresh chemicals. Each room with a processor also had a large floor drain for the chemicals, so it was a simple matter of placing the drain hoses into the drain opening, and release a valve. As I was finishing my third processor, the NCOIC, non-commissioned officer in charge, stopped by and got my attention by stiffly commanding, Private, come with me. He walked me down the hall to the chest room, which had its own dedicated film processor. He told me to do this one next and to use the new floor drains. He pointed out the gleaming new porcelain drain that was sunk into the floor a foot away from the old metal one. Now, I was standing nearly on top of the drains, while he was still by the open door of the room several meters away. I looked down and saw that the new drain was not connected to any pipes. I knew because I could see someone's desk through the bottom of the drains. I quickly tried to explain. Sergeant, I don't think it's ready for... He sternly cut me off. Private, I said use the drain. The contractor reported to me that it's finished and ready for use. No arguments. I wasn't unaccustomed to being ordered around. As a private, nearly everyone outranks you. Nevertheless, I tried once again to explain. But Sergeant, I can see. He cut me off again with a surly, Just do what you're told, private, and walked away shaking his head. Now, you can see where this is going. I always tried to be a good little soldier, but at the moment I could see that this sergeant was in greater need of an education than me. Nevertheless, I tried to find a better course of action. Buying myself time to think, I did everything I could to forestall using the drain. I cleaned the racks and even the outer panels of the processor, when specialist slacker popped his head into the door and snarked, what's taking so long? Finally, I had the chance to form an alliance with this person they'd placed between me and the boss, NCOIC. I quickly tried to explain, but Slacker cut me off. Just hurry up, I want to get to lunch. Then he walked out before I could reply. I actually had one more processor to clean, so I went and did that one, leaving the chest room processor in disarray. I was surprised nobody bothered me about it, but inevitably I had to return to the chest room. I placed both drain hoses into the new drain, peeking through to make sure nobody was currently sitting at the desk. I did yell into the drain, stand back, chemicals coming through, before I opened the valves and stood by, waiting for the storm. About two minutes later, I heard the thunder coming down the hall. The NCOIC, followed by a handful of other staff was shouting, shut it down, private, shut off the valve now. I heard this before they were even halfway down the hall, so I quickly shut both valves and stood as they stormed into the room. I held up my hands and simply said, it's off now. The NCOIC already knew what happened. He looked ready to beat on me, but didn't. He didn't demand an explanation, but he didn't have to. His staff quickly asked for one, and I told them how I tried to tell the NCOIC about the drain not being connected, but that he cut me off and ordered me to use it. Several of them glanced at their boss, and the truth was self-evident by his expression. Then they asked why I didn't tell anyone else, so I explained trying to tell Slacker about it, and how he blew me off as well. They asked where Slacker was, so I told them where I'd last seen him. One of the sergeants quickly retrieved Slacker and explained he was found napping in the x-ray exam room. That was the moment that SP4 Slacker took the brunt of the blame for this incident. 
I was completely off the hook, and I believe the NCOIC did indeed learn his lesson as well. The rest of my student experience wasn't impacted at all by this incident, although I almost got in trouble for doing an unauthorized spinal tap on a patient, but that's a whole different story that had nothing to do with this incident. The last story is, Chef, how long for that order? I was quite new to the hotel and very new to room service when this happened, so the chefs hadn't gotten to know me yet. I was waiting on an order, the only room service order, and the kitchen was not quiet. It wasn't busy, but there were a few orders queued up for the restaurant. I'd been waiting for the order for maybe seven to eight minutes and had picked a couple of quick, easy jobs to do while I waited. Not wanting to start anything else in case I didn't have time, I approached the sous chef, Satish, at the window. How long for that order, chef? F off. Something about the way he said it didn't cause me to instantly get peeved off. I was a bit confused and thought, maybe he thought I was rushing him? So I asked again differently. I'm just wondering how long I have before the order is ready. I said, F off. Okay, now I'm peeved off. You want me to F off? No effing bother, mate. I walked over to the room service station, grabbed the trolley, and went up to the seventh floor in search of dirty room service trays. The building's shaped like a U, and the service elevator is smack dab in the middle of the U. So when checking the floors, you need to pick one direction and walk until near the end, as there are little alcoves designed to hide the trays so it looks less dirty, to an extent. So you need to walk to one side, double back round to the elevator, and repeat for the other side. There are about 85 to 97 rooms, per floor, so it's at least half a kilometer walk per floor. I walked all six floors that had rooms on them. Ordinarily, I would grab four to five trays and pop back down to clear them off, but F that noise. I pile about 10 trays precariously, until it looks like Wiley Coyote's latest attempt to catch Roadrunner and take my Acme trolley back down. I arrive back downstairs a good 30 to 40 minutes later and can hear the echoes of this chef screaming room service half the hotel away. I stroll into the kitchen and walk towards the porter's station to unload dirty dishes and Satish finally spots me. Where the F have you been? I've been calling you for 20 minutes. I went to clear the floors. I asked you how long and you wouldn't answer. I can't stand around all day for one order. I have other SH to do. I'd ask and you'd tell me 10 minutes. I'll be back in nine. If you tell me two minutes, I won't even leave. I'll find something here. But if you tell me to F off, I'll do whatever I deem to be urgent. Satish doesn't answer. I can see he's not happy, but he's thinking. The moment seems to drag on. Finally, he starts laughing. Didn't expect that. He turns round to the chefs and says, this is effing ruined. I need a new one straight away. Turns back to me and politely says, two minutes. Not to push my luck, I unload the trays at breakneck speed and grab the new tray for this order and move to the window after 90 seconds. The fallout? Satish is actually a great guy and we got on like a house on fire after that. He would always tell me how long and we were actually the most efficient pairing. I have no idea why he was like that at the moment it happened, but he moved past it pretty quickly and was usually in a great mood. He would sing and dance when it was crazy busy to keep himself hyped up on adrenaline and we had plenty of laughs before I moved out about 8 months later. I hope you love these stories. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to know when the new videos come out.